Hello, um, I'm here with George Townsend. George is a, a writer, a researcher and a curator. He's based in London and he specialises in the history of freshwater bathing in the UK. So I'm absolutely delighted to, to talk to him today and uh, quiz him a little bit, um, particularly about swimming in the Thames, because that's a personal favourite of mine. Uh, I live local to the Thames, swim in here quite a lot. Um, and I know I've seen some stuff from George before that uh, swimming in the Thames has got a real rich history, mm -hmm. uh, despite the you know the current fears about pollution and currents and all sorts of other things that people worry us about. Um, so George, tell us just a little bit about yourself and then what got you interested in the history of, of swimming in the Thames? I grew up in a place called Farringdon, which is in um, in Oxfordshire, which is not on the Thames, but is is just a few miles away. And it was a very normal thing to do in the summer to to cycle or, or you know walk down to the river with friends as a kid and as a teenager, and sometimes go and camp down by the river and and swim. And it was sort of part of um, yeah, it was just part of our leisure I suppose as, as teenagers as kids and um, sometimes we'd also get the get the bus into Oxford and part of the attraction of that on a hot day would be that you would you'd bring your swimming stuff and you'd go to university parks which is a big park in the centre of Oxford and, and go and swim in the Charwa which is a tributary of the Thames there um, so there was that and I, you know I learned to swim just in the local leisure centre pool through swimming swimming lessons at school and then I, I went to study, I studied English literature at Oxford um, as a student. And um, it was at that point that um, I felt that swimming, the, the idea of like wild swimming was kind of taking off and it was becoming a bit more well known. And I was swimming more regularly and swimming through the winter for the first time. And it was at this point that I heard this story. I was told this story by a professor from the university where because uh, we'd been swimming I, I mentioned to him that we'd been swimming um in the charwa and he 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 said it, it reminded him of this story of a place called parson's pleasure which was um a bathing place on the charwa for men a nude bathing place on the charwa and the story goes that there's a group of um dons sunbathing naked on the riverbank and then suddenly a boat comes into sight and they see that um it's it's occupied by their students or whatever and so um most of the dons cover their cover their private parts and one of them covers his face and in the aftermath the, the clever one covering his face says i don't know about you but in oxford i'm known by my face um and this story was the beginning of me being interested in the history of people swimming in rivers because i mean i've, I've you know, to start with, I found it funny, but I also was kind of like, what the hell is this place <laughs> where academics are taking off all their clothes and sunbathing naked together? It felt like there was this real, really strong contrast between my experience of swimming in the rivers as a, as a kid, which was like very uh, informal. You know, there weren't really any particular places you were supposed to go um, very much wearing swimming costumes and also totally mixed boys and girls and then in this story you had this completely different picture where it was like an institution it was like a proper official place seemingly and uh you know different age group as well and nude and just just men so I was like kind of what what is this place and so that that really kind of um sparked my interest and, and I started um to research the history of Parsons Pleasure for fun to begin with i just thought I'd, i might write like an article about it for a magazine or something and um found some really fascinating stuff to begin with i was i was looking some of the early things were looking at c.s lewis's diaries and letters where he talks about spending time there after the first world war and the hit the the the, the documents of it go back to the seven, early sort of 17th century and then in a way, a thing that kind of got me even more hooked was beginning to do interviews with people who actually spend time there because it only closed in 1992. So mm. it's within living memory. And finally getting onto the Thames, I suppose, you know, this is the Charwa, but getting onto the Thames, I, 
one thing that became clear through this project looking at Parsons Pleasure is that it was part of this um, much, much bigger kind of ecosystem of bathing places um, all around Oxford and up and down the Thames. And, you know, these included very inf quite informal places. You know, originally mm -hmm. Parsons Pleasure was just a favourite place to go and swim that had a nickname um, before becoming commercialized and, and enclosed in the 19th century um yeah kind of all the way up to much more elaborate facilities um one that i've been really interested in re in re in recently is um the 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 river swimming bars that used to exist in in henley which mm. um i think in some ways were kind of similar to to parsons pleasure in terms of their origins in terms of it being a very informal spot to begin with and then in quite a um you know uh piecemeal way building up and becoming more of an institution but then in in the 1930s the whole place was completely overhauled and it rebuilt and they introduced this really kind of grand sweeping kind of almost amphitheater of changing cubicles with a lovely mm -hmm. great sunbathing lawn like running down to the river and diving diving boards diving platform and kind of shallow shallow sort of enclosed bits of the river a shallow bit and all this kind of stuff and That's um amazing yeah yeah so it's 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 it 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 led parson's pleasure led me into this lost world i suppose mm. of not just swimming in the river but the places of swimming in the river yeah so let me just take back to Parsons Pleasure a little bit. You mentioned, I think, that you're, uh, when you were looking back at sources, you found references to this place, sort of 17th century, mm. and then it was uh, closed down in, I think you said, 1992. Um, and do you, I mean, do you know, was it always a male-only place? Um, was it, and, and then you said it was kind of more form, formalised in its later years, but was it sort of fenced off? And I mean, what, what happened to it? And then why was it eventually closed down? Mm, so, yeah, I'll, I'll try and take those one at a time. So in terms of, um, yeah, the, the, the gender aspect of it, certainly in the early 19th century, um, it, well, well, yeah, so, so it, was, it, was an open, it was an open space um in the 17th century in an area that at that time was quite a remote bit of the town you know it's kind of really on the outskirts of the town mm -hmm. now oxford has grown massively and uh relatively speaking parsons pleasure is now quite central although it still feels because it's it's between two branches of the charwell it still has this slightly kind of secluded mm -hmm. feel to it um so it, it um in 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 the 17th and 18th centuries and then on into the early 19th century it was really part of this as far as i can gather from the available historical mm. stuff a very male dominated um culture of bathing in the rivers um you know you can never be you can never make absolute sort of statements about these things you know who like of course mm. women will have like in some situations been tempted to go for a go for a dip or whatever but yeah. but in terms of like what was officially kind of approved of and and happening certainly it was very male dominated um and then um uh yeah and then in 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 the 18 1840 in the 1830s it was it was it was commercialized there was kind of um uh there was a ongoing tension between the fishermen who mm -hmm. uh, rented that section of the river as as a fisherman, mm -hmm. and which came with a little kind of um, slice of adjoining meadow. There was a tension between him and these people who kept trespassing on his land to come and come and swim and bathe in the river. Mm -hmm. And this this got to the point where he he was actually um, taken to court for hitting a swimmer on the head with a with a punt pole because um, he was so so angry with these these trespassers. And then a few years later, he changed his tune and started charging the bathers to come onto his land, basically. Brilliant. So I guess he was sort of like, you know, if you can't beat them, uh, try and charge them. Mm -hmm. So at that stage, yeah, it was, it was um, it, it, you know, I think it was still very cheap. It was something like a penny to, to swim. Mm. 
um, which even at that time was not not a huge amount of money. Um, and then uh, things changed in the middle of the, the 19th century as they did across the city, really. The city was growing, there was more pollution, there was more policing of the outskirts and the public nudity. This is kind of before swimming costumes, really. Mm -hmm. Um, and as a result, a lot of the, the traditional bathing places were kind of blocked off, you know, were destroyed or enclosed off and, and kind mm. of weren't accessible anymore. And and in the case of Parsons Pleasure, um, you know, it was sort of it was sort of jeopardized by the proposed building of a new public footpath r right next to it. And the solution to that was to enclose it with, with screens. Um, and from that point, it became more kind of exclusive, I suppose, and the prices were hiked up and it became mm. it became more of a kind of aspirational on the part of the fisherman and his family who were still the people running it i think you know they were in, aspiring towards it becoming a a university institution that would be mm. the go-to place to swim for students and professors and ultimately it did kind of reach that goal but not really until you know the 20th century um but anyway, so there's there's that, you know, becoming a bit more elitist. Um, but that process of it um, being enclosed and being more regulated also made possible certain kind of experiments with how it might be run. Mm -hmm. So if you spoke to any person who knows a bit about Oxford history today, they would insist that Parsons Pleasure was a naked bathing place, for example. Mm -hmm. But there's some evidence that in this time after it was enclosed, they, the, the keeper kind of experimented with actually enforcing swimming costumes. And there are some images actually of people as a kind of beautiful book illustration of um, of a swimmer wearing a sort of loin loincloth thing, mm -hmm. um, which I mean, maybe to do with the modest, modesty of needing to create an illustration for this particular book. But anyway, it sort mm -hmm. of could be evidence of swimming costumes. And, an and another of the experiments at this point was letting women in at lunch times. Um, mm -hmm. so, so yeah, there is this period in the 1880s and 1890s where women were allowed in and could learn to swim, mm -hmm. um, presumably wearing swimming costumes. I think they only had the male attendant. Um, and and yeah i mean that that i mean maybe this is way too much information <laughs> but yeah it was sort of part of this exper ex wider experiment as well of, of women trying out new ways of being in, in public you know mm -hmm. riding bicycles or mm -hmm. like you know punting or rowing or like doing yeah. sports that had always been associated with men it's really in that kind of second half of the 19th century that a lot of women are breaking new ground and mm -hmm. that you also get in the Thames you get these amazing kind of performance and endurance swimmers like Agnes Beckwith who you might have heard of yes um it's yeah it's kind of part of part of that moment I think there was mm -hmm. one more question but I can't remember <laughs> oh it was what what led to its eventual closure in 1992 I think you said mm, yeah that I mean that's a controversial it's a controversial point really and some I mean the official line was that so by then it was officially owned and run by the university, but they hadn't had an attendant. They ceased to 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 employ an attendant in in the early seventies. So it had this period of about twenty years from the early seventies to ninety two, where it kind of went wild again. Mm. Um, in some ways, you know, it sort of weirdly, it kind of had more in common than more in common with the Parsons Pleasure of like the eighteen twenties or whatever than mm -hmm. it did with like. The period 20 years earlier so it, it and and um I, the official line in 92 was that the university had discovered that if there were an accident at the bathing place that they would be liable that, that they could get sued basically mm. but um there are all sorts of other theories as to, <laughs> as to what was going <laughs> on it was a male only nude bathing place so there was mm -hmm. a it was a gay definitely a gay scene there a gay cruising scene where people would it, it was a meeting place not that it was ever it was never kind of exclusively gay or straight it was you know it was kind of um this funny kind of in between shared place mm. um but i think it had this reputation of seediness mm. and um whether that was sort of justified yeah i don't know um but uh, I think another important 
you know, aside from, I mean, cause you know, some people think there's like, there must've been some kind of specific incident that like mm. caused it to be closed. And I, you know, that may well be the case. It's quite hard to dig down into these things, but I think that the broader picture is that these kinds of places were all closing down that, mm. um, you know, kind of from the seventies kind of maybe yeah. from the early mid seventies onwards, a lot of these official bathing places were, were, disappearing and and oxford city had a couple of municipal bathing places which mm -hmm. also closed in the late 80s early 90s mm. and parsons pleasure was sort of the last the last man standing mm. and um and i think to an extent the university kind of just felt like we just don't really want to have this kind of mm. thing on our books yeah <laughs> like it's like what are we doing yeah and okay. yeah and if you know so I'm fascinated. Yeah, that, so I, yeah. I kind of kept you focused on Parsons Green, although I really wanted to talk about the the, the history of swimming in the Thames. But I've Sorry, just got yeah, one no, kind of related bad. question yeah. to that because it's obviously you, you had this men only space hmm. during your like you've you've studied these places up and down the Thames. Did you ever find an equivalent for women? Is there you know a women's only exclusive bathing place, or was it only ever sort of men's places? Um. Yeah, there, there were there were um, there were women's bathing places. It certainly in um, well, I mean, in Oxford there was a place called Dame's Delight, which was open just next door to Parsons Pleasure in the in the thirties and was there until the late nineteen sixties. There was another place in Oxford called the Rhea, spelled R H E A, which was which was nearby, um, which was uh, yeah again just just women, and that was that was like late nineteenth century through until the sixties. And in Reading, um, at King's Meadow, there were these baths. They were kind of like a precursor to the Lido, where they were outdoor swimming pools, but the water came from the river. It was fed, mm -hmm. fed from the river. And um, initially, there was just a men's one. And then um, it became shared. It, you know, they alternated at different hours. Mm -hmm. And then there was sufficient pressure that a, a lady's pool was built, a women's pool mm -hmm. was built. And the, the the so though it, and though it's not fed by river water anymore, as I understand, the remaining outdoor Lido in in Reading there was the, the women's the women's mm. bath. So so yeah, those those places did exist, but I think I think that there was there remained a, a double standard about around how they were managed mm. because I I think that for example when Dame's Delight first was being planned um women from the women's colleges in oxford there's a there's a little kind of memorandum in the archives of, of the things that they were sort of demanding saying you know this mm. is how we want it to be run and it was very much we want a female attendant and we want swimming costumes to be optional so you know parity with what was going on just mm. just next door um but that that's not how it panned out and, and it ended up being run as a kind of family equivalent to Parsons Pleasure mm. where maybe that maybe it was women only at times, but actually children, you know, kind of children of either either gender were, were allowed in. And mm. so um so yeah, it's it's a mixed picture really. Okay. No, it's, it's fascinating. I didn't realise how much I mean, you know, some of the sources you've been digging into to to get, you know, you you mentioned letters of C.S. Lewis. Um, so I was wondering how you know, how far back I don't know how far back you've looked, but how far back have you seen evidence, or you know some of it might be suggestions rather than actual evidence of people using the Thames as a as a swimming mm -hmm. location. Um, the I, so I was recently re, I, I recently went to visit bath for the first time as mm -hmm. a, as a grown-up i've been been to bath i think i went on a school trip to bath once but but went there again recently and i, I got this book in um in a bookshop there by miranda oldhouse green called sacred britannia which is about sacred you know religion in in roman britain mm -hmm. basically and there's a bit towards the beginning where she quotes from this roman historian talking about the first um the first kind of encounter between the Romans and um, the native, um, you know, the indigenous Brit British uh, mm -hmm. people, uh, because there were two, you know, there was a sort of first invasion that didn't 
really come to much and then they went away for 100 years and then they kind of came back okay um and yeah there's this account of the people who live in in britain and i think it must be talking about the thames valley because i think that's the kind of how they made their way into the interior of the mm -hmm. um of the island as it were and this historian talks about how um most of britain seems to be underwater um which to me yeah. i think is like perhaps indicative of how the Thames was a floodplain rather mm -hmm. than a, you know, a canalised river. Mm -hmm. um, and also that the inhabitants of Britain seemed to be as at home in the water as they were on land and that they would mm -hmm. be swimming and wading um, wherever they went. So that that's kind of as far, as far back as I've, yeah. I've been able to go. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, and then there's all sorts of snippets in, from the, you know, the medieval period and Charles the second apparently loved swimming in the in mm -hmm. the Thames um uh that yeah he used to go to this quaint little village of Chelsea to go and uh, mm -hmm. go and swim in the <laughs> yeah <laughs> swim in the river okay um, so I, I mean one of the things I'm, I'm and you were talking about when you said oh you grew up swimming in the river I was like before you got on the call I was expecting someone a lot older because you know, when I was growing up, and I'm clearly older than you, there was this, there was a lot of fear mongering around outdoor swimming. And I'm sure that continued. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that 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 still exists to some extent. You know, there's a lot of uh, you know, never go in the river, there's undercurrents, uh, the cold will kill you immediately. You know, there was all sorts of things that that people spoke about to uh, basically put kids off swimming because you can't keep kids away from water. Uh, mm -hmm. But you were swimming quite happily in the um, in the Thames as a kid, which I, uh, you know, may maybe uh, maybe there's more of it going on than we even think, you know, because kids don't tell their parents what they're doing quite often; they just mm -hmm. go and have, <laughs> have fun. But you know, this uh, this idea that you you know that the water is something that people love, but it's also something that's really dangerous. Have you seen that kind of through the history of this sort of this interplay between fear and pleasure and and how that work, you know, how that pans out in in swimming, and how people have, have approached and dealt with the water. Mm. Yeah, it's definitely something that I've thought about, and you know, sort of thought about a bit. It's it's, uh, and it, and and in a way, it relates to this question also of what's your default swimming environment as well. So you know, I grew up as I mentioned, you know, I learned to swim in a leisure centre pool. So in a way, a swimming pool is kind of my default environment even though I love to swim in rivers or, or in the sea or whatever S sort of anyway I'll sort of explain what I mean by that I guess I guess w what I was going to say is that it, it, yeah there's always been that back and forth and but you know up until the 20th century um there was a big emphasis on people learning to swim in rivers for safety reasons, basically, mm -hmm. um, and creating these designated places for swimming, kind of, you know, relatively safe places in the river um, in order that um, children could, could, learn, could learn to swim and not just learn to swim as a sort of abstract technical thing, but learn to swim in a river environment which has mm -hmm. its own you know particularities and it's only really kind of a bit later as as indoor swimming pools and i mean and you know this varies so much in different areas of the of the country in terms of how close people are to water when water gets polluted if it gets polluted and urbanization and all that kind of thing but um broadly it's only really later that um you know the river kind of gets cancelled as a place to <laughs> mm. as a place to swim or at least as like the default place to swim um but but yeah so i i think that's something that i think is 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 really important about these places of swimming is that the the whole point of them was that it was about there are people you know we're having these incidents of of people drowning in the rivers mm -hmm. we're going to we want to deal with this by making sure that people know how to swim in a river mm -hmm. um and you know that doesn't that that simply doesn't sort of like match onto our present day moment in any neat way i'm not saying mm. that like we can just apply that attitude again but i think that's an important thing to sort of think about with the past um 
Yes. What else was I going to say? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and, and also, you know, you had, uh, there was a lot more, I mean, it, there has been this amazing sort of resurgence of, of um, people spending their spare time on and around rivers mm -hmm. in, in the rivers as well. Um, but uh, there have been previous waves of hanging mm. around, you know, messing about in boats being the thing to do. Um, and yeah, so in a way it was, it was a lot of it was to do with safety. You know, if you were going to go and go on a rowing trip for fun or a rowing trip for work as a fisherman mm -hmm. or, you know, transporting things up and down the river, it was important that you knew how to swim so that you could mm. keep safe. I mean, there was also yeah. a whole pleasure aspect, you know, it was also fun, but, yeah. um, but I think that's yeah. Does that does that sort of speak to your mm. <laughs> question? Yeah, and that's, that's the other thing that that sort of perhaps related to that is kind of how these the the popularity of river swimming has kind of ebbed and flowed. And obviously, mm. we, we've you know nineteen seventies, eighties, nineties, there was a, a big decline. Sort of late, uh, you know, two thousand and tens, early two thousands, maybe starting off two thousand and tens growing interest again and then the pandemic big interest big spike in interest i mean have you seen these these sort of ebbs and flows of interest in swimming through history or is it too difficult to track kind of how that goes i i think that um i think that that um that sort of 70s 80s 90s moment is the exception rather than the rule I mean, it, there's also a quite in the sense that people prior to that and and again now, the norm has been that people do swim in their their local kind of bodies of water, mm. as as far as I can gather. Um, uh, at, but you know, obviously that's with the sort of caveat of who who is actually doing the swimming in terms of particularly in terms of gender. Mm. Um, uh, and I just, yeah, I sort of feel like it's, it, it's, it's sort of, you know, I mean, I mean, again, you know, I'm sure there will, I'm sure there'll be a, a big sort of geographical diversity around this. So you might, you might, I mean, I haven't really looked at this, but you might imagine that the, um, the sort of religious experience in different parts of the UK might affect how comfortable people were with being naked in public, mm. um, with other people um uh and yeah i don't know there was something else i was gonna say yeah um i can't remember it slipped my mind um <laughs> not to worry but yeah I mean, for me, like, the, some... the mystery is like what what happened there like what, yes uh and i think it was probably a long time coming and it will be a long time before we really kind of understand it and find a new settlement which i think we're sort of moving towards but mm. but um but to me, that's that's the odd that's the odd um, odd kind of time, really. Yes, and I mean I've, I've seen some of the the pictures you've managed to track down and, and illustrations from sort of swimming spots in the in the past, you know, with elaborate diving boards and all sorts of things that just they've all gone. You know, we don't have diving boards, even though you know we know kids love to jump off bridges and things, and you know, build jumping out of trees and stuff, mm. and. I don't know if you if you've got anything that you can you can share on that because I'd like I think some yeah, of yeah, yeah. and and you know some what's the history behind some of these places and how did they get away with having diving boards in the river that we just can't do now? Yeah, <laughs> let's have a look. I'll see what I can um I can pull up. Maybe we'll we could have a look at um at Henley, which I mentioned. Yes. Um. Yes. Let's just let's just have a quick look. Right, my very um uh perfectly arranged archives. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, let's have a look. I'll get a nice picture of any. Um, good one. Right. Okay. I'll share screen. Open. Yeah. Um, where's the share screen? It should be at the should be at the bottom of the screen. Is online. There's a there's a green arrow. If you move your yeah, let's yeah yeah yeah. Just need to make that a bit wider. 
Um, That's why we should have practiced this in advance, shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> that that might come up now. Yeah. Can you see that? Oh yeah. That's yes. Amazing, isn't it? So this is this is Henley swimming bars in in about 1934. So wh whereabouts in Henley is is this or was this? It's over over the bridge from the town. So mm -hmm. off Wargrave Road, which is the road that kind okay, of goes so you, so you come out of Henley, go over the bridge, turn right. Yeah, you turn right, and then you keep going until you get to what is today the the Henley Rowing Club, which is mm -hmm. on this on this site. So when it when the the baths closed down um, in the late nineteen seventies, they were the site was eventually taken on by by the local rowing club who were looking mm. for premises, and they um, they built built their you know their boat houses and stuff there. So mm. you can go there today and and. Um, and and see the remains. I can show. I can show, show you some sort of um, slightly sort of archaeological um, remains of what's 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 there. I went to visit um, the rowing club uh, this summer. So that's amazing. So until the nineteen seventies, there was a like a dedicated Lido in the in the Thames at Henley. Yeah, 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 big time. Um, uh, uh well, presumably that that was a pay to pay to enter type of thing uh was yes it? i think so yes so that i mean and, and that's a point that really varied as well was like who who was who was running these places and what was the kind of um what was the sort of system mm. uh because you know the, in oxford for example you did have these municipal bathing places that were that were basically always free um so can you see that picture now yeah so so this is where the rowing club is now and yeah. the the bench that's closest to us is an original <laughs> 1930s bench amazing and um there's this kind of semicircle of concrete yeah um uh which which again is is kind of part of the original design and just that sort of concrete coping all the way along the mm -hmm. um along the riverbank gives you a sense of the length of um the space that that was all sort of for swimmers to sit on get in and out of the water and yeah yeah exactly in fact i've got another picture which shows it in the 30s from this same angle so i should show you that one show you that one now um it's often really helpful to kind of um yeah try and find try and look at the same angle uh is that angle three just a sec yeah so the, these were run was it was it a private facility or was it sort of run by the the council this one this one was um initially it was an in just a totally informal bathing place mm -hmm. um and then it was um taken on i think it was 1870s or 1880s there was this thing called the henley um henley bathing company was set up by local mm -hmm local swimmers and people from the town and so it was run run by a private company but kind of not really for profit i think there were shareholders but like the chairman didn't take any money from it or something it was a voluntary mm -hmm. role um and then i believe that in in this moment where it was um where it was revamped in 1934 it was it, it then became a, a town um town council facility mm -hmm. but I, so do you, do you have a date on this picture yeah i think this is i think this is 1930s as well okay because it, this it, this looks like it's a, a mixed facility at that time yeah absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. yes uh, yes and i think that i don't know whether i don't know whether the new design i don't know whether that coincided with the introduction of mixed bathing or whether that had been going for a bit already certainly mm -hmm. women had been able to swim at at Henley Bars before I mean it was it was also rebranded in terms of the name at this point and it was prior to the 30s it was it was known as Solomon's Hatch um mm. which is a bit of a a bit like Parsons Pleasure it's a bit of a um it's a bit of a mystery the closest I've got to in terms of figuring out why it was called Solomon's Hatch is that the gates to medieval forests were often known as hatches and um mm -hmm. The, there was a massive forest of Windsor in in mm. um, in the medieval times, which did extend to this area. And there are a couple of mm. villages nearby called Play Hatch and Hare Hatch. So I think that possibly that name goes 
quite a long mm. way <laughs> back. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I, see, I see there's a diving board there. I mean, that's a relatively mm. dope diving board, but I've seen some of the other pictures that, you know, there, there, there are some significant platforms that people built into the river. I don't know if you've got any of those that you can share because... Yeah, yeah, definitely, it's... definitely. So I'll show, I'll show one actually from... Um, uh, another just from from the Honey Swimming Bars. I'll show one more from Honey Swimming Bars and then uh, uh, we'll, I'll get some pictures of Abingdon. Um, yes, find it. Yeah, so this is the, um, oops, this is the opening ceremony of, um, the Henley swimming baths in, in, mm -hmm. in 34. And you can see wow. at the front here, we've got this, um, that's, that's the, 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 uh, yeah a, a diving platform that's out out of shot in that last yeah um and this is uh there's a, a, a this is a guy called alexis chesnikov who was a, a russian um refugee uh musician you know famous mm -hmm. for his guitar so he sort of serenaded the um serenaded the crowd um but yeah i'll get that's, okay. that's quite a high that's like looks like a two or three meter diving board there. yeah i think it was pretty pretty significant um let's have a look at abingdon and see how that compares um yeah so in abingdon similar slightly shorter time frame than this this place um which um yeah kind of op opened around the same time uh in the in the 18 early 1880s i think and then remained active until uh, the 1940s and this is it painted again in the 1930s mm. actually by um a local artist called oswald cooldry um so so this this is a contemporary painting yeah uh, yeah this is from the 1930s the painting yeah, yeah. so uh, this yeah. one's clearly mixed as well at that time it was at that point yeah yeah um and uh yeah you can see that they have this sort of double layered um diving platform which also appears in some photos mm. of the place um prior to that diving platform it seems as though they would just climb up onto the roof of the sheds and dive off yeah. <laughs> dive off the sheds yeah. um so yeah and and i think that i mean it's an interesting question as to how i i think that it may be that these places were built at spots that happen to have particularly deep areas of the riverbed, or perhaps mm. they were they were dug out a bit. I mean, I think generally there was a um, a tendency to be less um, less cautious around the depth that you should be diving into than there is mm. today. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah, there. I mean, there are all sorts of yeah, all sorts of these yeah. Sort of oh, it's so it's so fascinating. Um, so you know, you've you've spent a lot of time looking at the, these different places, um, you know, and, and and they've all gone really, haven't they? Um, if you were going to bring back something, what what would you bring back and and have in the Thames today? I th I think that we do. Well, I th I think that we it, it's it's this thing about specific places that have a bit of kind of um but i suppose particularly specific places that are um close to where people live mm. um for pe so that people can swim in the river conveniently as part of their everyday lives mm. and sometimes that may mean adding in a ladder or you know cordoning off a bit of river at certain mm. times you know i think that I, i'm i i think that it would be extremely difficult to have a, a Henley swimming baths pop up overnight in the 2020s. Like it's not, it's not going to happen like that, but, but in, you know, that's an interesting example because it started so small. It just started mm. with people going to the same place that they really yeah. hoped and was convenient for them over and over again and, and kind of go, building from there. And obviously our priority is now very different, you know, where people do wear swimming costumes and <laughs> Yeah, time. and it's not really that big a deal. I mean, obviously, some people love to not not wear a swimming costume as well, but yeah. it's not it's not kind of a massive controversial issue. No. <laughs> it was in the past, but I think that um, uh, yeah, I'm I'm one thing I'm interested in is those sort of 
interventions into these natural spaces you know quite mm. gentle interventions that can kind of make things safer and, and mm. convenient and um and that generally you know i'm at, you know that would really look different in all sorts of in different environments i think mm. and and looking back does it seem that you know the, you say that you know they started off quite small people just swimming in a place were they were these developments quite often led just by individuals acting within their community or or was it sort of top down um you know political power saying oh my god all these people swimming here we need to do something for them um, or, or a bit of both yeah def definitely varied i think i think henley is a good example of a place where it was quite grassroots as, as you might say i think that i think that mm -hmm. there were or, or you know a kind of mixture of grassroots and town um authorities you know i think that the people who like to swim at this place were very it was very socially mixed and mm -hmm. and that included people who uh, I mean, you know, one of the first, I think the first sort of chairman of the Henley Bathing Company was also the borough surveyor. He was like part mm. of the town council and stuff and quite a significant local figure. Um, but it was also very popular among all sorts of other people from the mm. town. So so there were times when things kind of harmonised in that way. Um, in, in Oxford, the picture is quite different where, as I was saying before, a lot of the sort of informal bathing places were sort of just destroyed effectively in the mid 19th century. And it was really through popular demand and popular pressure on the council that a small number of official bathing places were, were created mm. um and but yeah i mean i think it it, it, it always it, it always demands that there is a is a that there always needs to be a, a demand for it really um mm. um but but I, but I also kind of wonder about certain places now. Whether are you going to get that demand if it, if it, you know, if there are all sorts of obstacles mm. um, to people just kind of dipping their toes in to begin with? Um, yeah. So it's tricky. Yeah, it's tricky. But you know, I also kind of feel, you know, I, I don't know. There's some quote from so I can't remember who was saying this the other day about how like all. <laughs> all social change is kind of just small groups of determined people getting together and trying to make something happen <laughs> um yeah. a lot of it can kind of be boiled down to that and i think that 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 is so important and i see you know i see that happening with with swimming groups and and mm. on, on all sorts of fronts and and little groups joining together to make make bigger groups as well mm. which is, is really exciting to see cool so if there's one thing you know if, uh, for for people like me that that want to promote outdoor swimming and want to encourage more people to to swim outdoors and um, is there one lesson from history that we could apply today or that we should we should be aware of today that you you would you could share mm, that's yeah that's a really good one i i i think that it's like i think that a thing that drives a lot of my interest in this stuff so my background is in studying English literature and sort of like, you know, fi fiction, basically, mm. poetry and that kind of thing. A academically, you know, that's what that's what I studied as an undergraduate. Um, and I think that's that's a big thing that I still really love. And I think that um, a big part of what drives my interest in all this stuff is a sense of these this experience of swimming in a river, whether it's at a bathing place or whether it's just wherever you wherever you do it, is partly a, a sort of imaginative experience that it's mm -hmm. it's it's involves taking that step outside of everyday life and um imagining or and kind of acting out for a moment that you are you live according to different rules, you know, which is kind mm -hmm. of literally true and that your body is buoyant and gravity seems to be sort of suspended. But I think that, you know, you can kind of hear it in the names of these places as well, like Solomon's Hatch, Parsons Pleasure, Dame's Delight, you know, there, there's a sort of poetry to it. There's a sort of, mm. um, uh, yeah, a kind of, it's the sort of bathing place of the imagination is I think what, mm. what I want to like encourage people to, to like, explore more mm. um uh which can take all sorts of 
forms. That's probably a bit wishy washy, but yeah, that's sort of what comes to mind. Yeah, it was somehow <laughs> catching uh, the almost the spirit spirituality of it, I guess, and the and the escapism of it. Mm, yeah, yeah, totally, totally escapism, but also a kind of communing with something, something other. You know, mm. becoming a bit more like a creature for for a bit, um, yeah. and and kind of thinking and experiencing what what you know what is my place in relation to the world and i mean yeah you can get really um <laughs> philosophical about it but which you know you don't have, you also don't have to you can just, yeah. just like go for a swim it's not a big deal but cool. um but i think that there is something in there that sort of mm. yeah keeps me coming back back to it as a swimmer and also as someone doing mm. research and stuff yeah and then just finally i think um, you, you've got um tell us a little bit about um you've got a couple of exhibitions coming up haven't you and and even a, you're working on a book as well you want to tell us a, all related to outdoor swimming i think yeah want, yeah no definitely tell us a little bit about that before we wrap a, bit, up. a bit of a, a bit of a one trick pony i mean it's sort of um yeah i do think that like maybe one day i'll i'll sort of start focusing on something different but um it doesn't seem to be coming up anytime soon so so yeah i yeah kind of Put, help put together a couple of shows one last year with the museum of oxford which is um also took the form of a podcast which is still available which i can i can share the link so oh, yeah, it was please really do. really fun to put together yeah um so that's that's specifically about the history of swimming in the rivers around around oxford um then this summer i did a show with a single artist with this printmaker called duncan montgomery who makes mm -hmm. beautiful very very fine wood engravings and this show focused on parsons pleasure and the ponds on hampstead heath sort mm -hmm. of putting those histories and sort of visual worlds side by side and then next summer well i mean i'm 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 in talks about uh uh an exhibition about the the history of swimming in the thames for mm -hmm. next summer which in theory will be a bigger kind of more more ambitious thing mm -hmm. but it's I, it's not really been properly confirmed so i don't want to be too um, okay yeah far enough but but yeah i mean kind of more more of the same in a way but just yeah. kind of bigger <laughs> and and uh, a book in the process as well or is that your that was it yeah your phd thesis yeah exactly yeah i mean I, it, it it's it's such a it's been such a slog working on that i mean I, in a way i mean it's just writing a book proposal i don't know if that's something you've ever ever done or attempt it's like I don't know it feels like such a speculative thing to work on that it's it's very easy it's always really easy for me to find something more important that to mm. do and i you know so i kind of work on it and fits and starts and but I, yeah so in theory it will be a book of the thesis which was about parsons pleasure but it you know i, I want i i want to make it something that's that does open open the topic up to, mm. to a, a, a big you know to lots of people who might want to read it rather than it being like just sort of like too academic yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah mm -hmm. okay right well good luck with that and um yeah. yeah well i'd love to if you could share the link for the podcast um that would be amazing and um yeah if you get um though if those exhibitions are uh, kind of open or and you know anyone let, let please let us know because we'll, we'll share that and uh i'm sure people would love to go and have a look great great cool yeah um yeah, and thanks, thanks really, thanks very much for yeah inviting me to have a chat. It's been really nice. Yeah, no, it's <laughs> super, super interesting. Um, but I'm, I'll end it there. I'll stop recording. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Cool. Thanks, Simon.